Welcome to this episode of the Angel Rated Show. I'm Angela Bryant and with me today I have Eowyn Levine. Eowyn helps self-employed creatives, artists and healers make friends with money so it can be a solid foundation for their life instead of a big energy drain. So welcome Eowyn. Oh, you thank start... you. You're very welcome. Do you want to start <laughs> by telling us a bit about yourself and your business? Yes, I'm coming to you from Manhattan, New York City, despite being a country bumpkin at heart. I am settled in here with my spouse, who's a classical musician, a couple of cats, and I run a solo massage practice, which I've been doing for nine plus years. And I am about a year into a new business that's parallel to that business, which is, as you said, helping creative folks, especially those who work for themselves, get better with money. I also have a podcast called creatives do money i'm all about on the nose like my business is plum tree money the podcast is creatives do money no circumspection here so yeah in that podcast i have some solo episodes which so far have really just been introducing folks to the kind of grounding practices of what does it look like to just handle your money on a day-to-day -day basis especially when your income varies and things can be a bit chaotic just as a result of owning your own business and then I've also been having a series of really wonderful honest conversations with self-employed creatives about what money looks like in their life some about their money story and so on and just introducing some quote-unquote experts and sharing some of that as well and it's been a lot of fun fantastic sounds like you're yeah this is a real journey that you're going to be going on with these creatives as well yeah, that's my interest. You know, money work, working on your finances is one of those core parts of life, like caring for your physical health or for your mental health. It's just an integral part of life. So there is no like take a three month course about money and then be done with it. I mean, yes, sure. Take a three month course about money if you want to do that. And that feels right for you. But then the work continues for the rest of our life. So it really is a lifelong journey together. Absolutely. Fantastic. So do you want to tell us a bit more about the sort of why behind your business and why you started it? Yeah, I have a few elements of the why. The moment that is most poignant for me is a moment when I was looking through my mother's things after she died of cancer about seven years ago. I found this little folded up hundred dollar bill in her wallet and realized I had seen it years before she had asked me to grab something for her. And it gave me pause specifically because that hundred dollar bill was the sum total of her financial legacy. I have no judgment around financial legacy. I don't think people should die handing off a bunch of money to their children. And that is better than dying with a hundred dollar bill in your wallet. It was poignant because I knew she wanted something different for herself. That wasn't enough for what she wanted for her life. She wanted the freedom that would have come with having more money in her life. And that really stays with me, this feeling that getting good with money in my life, making money, tending to money and giving money and doing what I want to do according to my values is it feels like living out what my female ancestors in particular weren't able to do. So that's something I carry with me daily. I literally still have that hundred dollar bill in my wallet. It sits with me. I also have personally experienced kind of hitting my rock bottom moment in finances. I've always been a good saver, but for years was trying to get out of credit card debt and just never managed. There was, it always just crept up again. I would save money, a big expense would come along and then suddenly I was in debt again. And I had kind of a, all right, that's it. Never again moment several years ago and really dove into personal finance and handling my money. And within eight months of taking it really seriously and being very intentional about it, everything had changed. My net worth had increased by 32% while my income stayed the same. And I, it just, I had like that, like mind explosion emoji moment. I was like, oh, this makes a real difference. I'm making the same amount of money. The income is just as variable as it was before, but this, this is awesome, honestly. And I started to really enjoy handling my money and just feel really confident around it. And uh, when the pandemic hit and I saw how many folks who are in the arts or creative industries, of course, those, you know, revolving around in-person gathering, just how deeply impacted they were and unready for catastrophe. 
Um, and of course, nobody hopes for catastrophe, but part of getting good with money is preparing for catastrophe and kind of having a comprehensive sense of how to handle things so you can do that. And it was just a wake up moment for me. Of, I feel like there's an area that I could really be helpful. Creatives and healers and artists and my people, like my parents, my spouse, all of my dearest loved ones, like everybody lives in this world. And yeah, my dearest wish is that those who create beautiful things in the world can have this foundation of confidence around money. I love that story about the hundred dollar bill and your mum. I that, know. Yeah, just really <laughs> resonated completely. Yes. I can imagine it. And there's um, such a there's such a you know, of course, like the core tenet that money isn't everything of course money isn't everything money isn't anything on a certain level my mother lived an adventurous well-loved incredible life but there was this this yeah this area mm. yeah and, and as you say it's it's so true for so many creatives and artists that they have that mentality that either they shouldn't be making money or there's something wrong with making money or yeah and if you're living in that something that doesn't have a steady paycheck, then obviously that makes it all the much harder when something like a pandemic hits. I mean, that's- Yeah, it's like a match made in hell. You know, if you have progressive, um, caring values, often you're just kind of ignoring the money side of things because it, it's too related to the damage that we see in the world done by capitalism and combine that with variable income and it's, yeah, it's a match made in hell. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, that's a great phrase. But uh, yeah, really, I can imagine why so many people get into that mindset and how difficult it is to, to shift totally. some, of those, so, some of those thoughts and feelings. So what sort of legacy do you want to create with this business? What are you aiming to do with it over the coming years? Yeah, the dream that I have nurtured and carried with me now for a really long time, um, I don't even know how long it is, maybe 16, 17 years. I am very passionate about regenerative agriculture and sustainability. And I've always dreamed of stewarding, not necessarily owning, but stewarding a piece of property and really seeing what can be done through working on that land to increase its resilience, increase its diversity and give back in a way that a lot of humans activity on the earth is very extractive. So to try and do my part to balance that out, but it's a big dream and it involves a lot of money and uh, being a massage therapist in New York city <laughs> does not equal a lot of money. And so yeah, I my body is feeling ready to end massage therapy, but my big dreams are also feeling ready for more money flowing through my life. It sounds like that's a yeah, that sort of big why, that real pull forward to help you think yeah. about where you want to take this business in the future. Yeah. And there's a lot of adjunct kind of elements that want to play in. I think 10 years ago, my vision was quite ignorant of, I guess, accessibility to experiences such as owning land and living on property. And as I've educated myself about privilege and just the challenges of being a human being in the States, if you're not one of the lucky privileged few, I've kind of, yeah, I've adjusted my understanding of what it would look like to do the work that I envision. Um, but that core tenet of regenerating land remains. So how, how does your current business and working, you know, with creatives move you towards that? Is it do you want to do something with the land that links to the creatives or is it are they two sort of is one the big vision and one's just your way of getting there? It's both. Yeah, it's both. Um, I mentioned very briefly that my spouse is a musician. And so he has a little bit of a co-dream, which is to host artist and musician residencies and have recording, um, a recording studio on land. And yeah, I, while I value my personal time and my quiet time, I love having people around me. I have lived in intentional communities and the image of opening up property to people to come and visit and spend time and do their work and benefit from the environment is definitely an exciting piece of doing it. Uh, yeah. Amazing. So tell me a bit more about what your, your, I mean, it's quite a fledgling business, but what have you been doing in terms of responding to some of the issues that we have going on in the world at the moment? Yeah, 
In all honesty, I've been doing some poking around and some testing and trying to, you know, I know what made an impact in my life and I know what's made an impact in those close to me. So I've been going through a process of noticing that there is a lot of information online about how to handle your business finances if you're a creative and if you're self-employed, but much less so how to handle your personal finances. Most personal finance information out there is a lot of like old white men telling you to like put your savings on autopilot and, you know, retire with a boat and your lake house or whatever the cliche might be. So I've been spending some time just observing where those gaps are and realizing that focusing on handling your personal finances um, when you have variable income is a big part of it. And also just getting clear, like what, what are those kind of ideological blocks that exist for folks? And um, yeah, just identifying that, you know, anti-capitalist leanings and, you know, social justice commitment those things, noticing how those things get bundled together with a rejection of spreadsheets and using a budget and all kinds of like conventional finance speak, which can be super off-putting, let, to, let alone just make people want to run and scream. So obviously there's sort of, you can have that combination of being committed to social justice and still loving a spreadsheet and being all over finances and money and... yeah. So yes, not only are they not mutually exclusive, when you get better with money, you have more money available to you to do whatever the heck you want to do in the world. And the world does not benefit when you suffer and you can't pay your rent and you can't have adequate health care. Nobody benefits. Like nobody's life gets better because you can't pay your rent on time. And I think getting to the point where you understand that the more money you make and the better you are with your money, because Lord knows how much you make does not equal how much you have to give to others and do what you want to do in the world. So the better you get with all of that, the more impact you can have. Absolutely. The bit, yeah, you, you don't have to be that subscribe to the suffering artist and think about those things. You can change that mindset to really see money, not as being evil or something yeah. awful, but something that you can actually really do good with. Someone who I really look to around that question is the author Elizabeth Gilbert. So she, of course, wrote Eat, Pray, Love that many know her for, but she's also just an exquisite novelist. Her fiction is really beautiful. And she also um, has the book. I'm now name. I'm like blanking on the name about creativity. Big magic. There we go. So, and in Big Magic, she really makes a point to outline the fact that she has always had day jobs. She was like raking in the dough from Eat, Pray, Love before she considered finally giving up the businesses that she had that gave her the income. And it wasn't necessarily out of scarcity mindset. It was simply that she, she had built strong financial foundations for her life, even like in her teens and twenties of just realizing that handling her money and being good with money and making money was completely independent from her work. And clearly she's prolific. She's highly active in social justice and queer rights and, you know, just doing all the things and being an artist and being really good with money. Yeah, I love it. And I love that book. Yeah, amazing. I know, right? Really good book. So is there, is your, do you or do your business support any charities? Do you have, have other impacts that your business have on, you know, some of these issues that are happening? Yeah, so I'm not doing at the moment, actually, literally because of the pandemic, I've been unable to list or register a DBA or, or register an LLC in uh, New York state. So I'm just a sole proprietorship. And so all of the giving that I do regularly happens personally, um, through my personal money. And I have three categories of regular donating that I do every month. So I donate to some Patreon accounts of artists and writers who work, whose work means a lot to me. I have a monthly donation to something called Savory Global, which is dedicated to educating farmers around pasture management and regeneration of land through using grazing animals, which to the vegans listening to this or watching this is going to raise a ton of red flags, in which case I just encourage 
a deep breath and maybe looking into some of the work, but it's powerful and impactful and not all land is arable in the sense that you can grow soybeans or grains or vegetables on. There's a ton of the world's land that isn't available for that kind of growing. And it's very meaningful to look at the impact of grazing animals on regenerating soil as the health of the topsoil is actually what allows us to grow food and clothing and anything else we want to grow on the land. So that's a long side note. And there's a lot more to be said there, but I donate to Savory Global. And then I also donate to an organization dedicated to ending for-profit prisons here in the States. I don't know if you have for-profit prisons in the UK, but they are God awful. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many things one can point to, but for-profit prisons or like advertising medications on television, like some of these insanities are just unique to the United States and they just, they just need to end. Nobody should be making a profit through putting brown people in shackles. And so I donate to them as well. And yeah, those are the three main categories of my regular donations. And then other things come in here and there if there's a political campaign or something else comes up. So for people that aren't aware of Patreon, do you want to just explain a bit what about what other people could do if they're interested in how to support artists that are out there that they love? Or... Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really love Patreon. It's a tech platform that allows artists and creators to charge some monthly fee. Usually there's a bunch of different tiers that people engage. Could be YouTubers, writers, visual artists, musicians. A lot of people use it. And it's a way for individuals to directly support the artist without going through other avenues where various large corporations are siphoning off much, siphoning off much of their work. I mean, the perfect example is Spotify, which is a way so many people consume music content or podcast content as well and I know a musician who posted on Twitter one time 36,000 plays on Spotify $17 in my bank account or something along those lines it could have been even less than $17 but they get paid almost nothing for Spotify to get rich from their incredible creations so what you can do is you can look at the name of the person whose music you love you go to their patreon you sign up for five dollars a month you might get an extra video or maybe a reflection on their part like they can offer a wide variety of different quote-unquote perks for being there as far as i'm concerned my main interest is just to be like hey i love what you do i'm giving you a little bit of money every month it means a lot to me uh, yeah, it's been, I think, revolutionary for a lot of creatives who live now when so many people expect all this incredible content to just appear for free for them, which it often does. Yeah, it's a great solution. And I think there's quite a few other things out there now, like buy me a coffee or similar things yeah. that people are having on their various social media profiles. So you can just, yeah, buy them a coffee, yeah. just do something nice and support people who are creating all this wonderful art that we consume yeah and I feel like it's also it's a very concrete way of kind of waking people up to the meaning of the arts and creative people like we just take it for granted we see it in architecture we see it in advertising like we see it in all these ways where it's just presented to us without us having to consciously engage and realize there's a human being behind there with a huge amount of training and all of this work and all of this like just cool stuff going on. And it kind of wakes you up. It's like, oh yeah, there's a human being there. They also deserve to make a living the way someone who has a quote unquote job does. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that the pandemic has shown is just how much we miss those sort of creative outlets when they suddenly all get shut down and taken away yeah. from us and we have no theatres and we have no live concerts yeah. or anything else going on. I One of the amazing things about living in New York City is the sheer mass of talent that resides here and during the pandemic a lot of musicians have just played on the streets and more than once I've just stopped with tears streaming down my face just missing it so much you know there's a jazz musician who plays at the farmer's market where my massage office is and yeah whenever I can I stop and listen and give him some money and I'm just like oh yeah when are we going to be able to just gather together again and have these common experiences that are just transformative and moving. Mm, yes, I love that. Or funny that. and irreverent, like whatever yeah. the thing is, you yeah. know, but yeah. But any, yeah, the whole any, yeah, of anything. art and culture and everything. <laughs> so is there anything else that you've not mentioned that would, that 
is sort of part of your worldview or your personal values that you've that you'd be willing to share? Well, I feel like I haven't really talked very much about the money stuff. And I'd like to just share that I've I've slowly over the years realized that handling your finances and being intentional with managing your money is really a personal practice. It is something that you can do to tend to yourself every day, like stretching or drinking enough water or eating food that feels good in your body. Like that act of checking your bank balances, recording the things you want to record, looking ahead for the next week or two and saying, all right, what's coming up? What do I want? What do I need to do? How much money do I need to reserve to make sure I'm taking care of things, not putting things on a credit card? Like that process, while it can sound really prosaic, it is profound and it's a way of deeply caring for your future self in just the same way as caring for your body or your mental health. So I just really like to underline that because the work itself can, I mean, I suppose it's equivalent to going to the gym and just sweating and doing your reps and like just being over it, but you don't necessarily have like the neurotransmitter rewards that you get when you go to the gym. So once you've made yourself go to the gym, like nobody regrets a workout once they've done it, you don't get that same like visceral hit when you do like when you tend to your finances but nonetheless it's the same kind of practice like you just you do the work once you learn it and you get good at it and you create those habits doesn't take a ton of time but the impact on your future self is pretty rad Mm. (laughs) people even say rad anymore I don't know probably not I'm a child (laughs) of like the 80s and the 90s so yeah absolutely me too (laughs) And I think, I mean, just thinking about some of those things, some there's so many new sort of, especially in the UK, we're getting so many new bank accounts now or sort of banking institutions, which are really modernizing what you can do and what you can track and how easily you can categorize yeah. everything that you're spending. And it, I'm sure if they're not already doing it, it will become more gamified. It will become, it will use a lot of the you know, positive reward psychology going forwards because yeah. you can just see how that's going to start happening with some of the new technology. Yes, yeah, more and more so. Although I will just provide a word of caution, which that in itself can be something that the folks that I work with become resistant to as well. This idea that there's always another app and always another tech solution for something in our day-to-day life. And then your phone suddenly has 58 different apps on it and you can't find anything. And then how do you use that program anyway? And now I have to take a whole course so that I can learn QuickBooks. And so I will say that if using apps and software fits for you and your personality and your natural strengths, awesome. Like use it all. But you also could just use a pen and paper and have a highly functional system or just a simple spreadsheet. So I will just say that folks need to find what fits them best. Although one note just on what you're pointing to is online banking and the ability to have multiple different accounts within one institution without paying extra fees. Like that is huge. Like just to be able to like categorize your pots of money, it can be one of the ways that you motivate yourself over time as you build up your savings or whatever you're doing yeah Mm. yeah juicy really yeah (laughs) it it is because it's I yeah I am one of those people that has always you know love money and I you know quite enjoy counting money or looking Uh understanding how and I love a spreadsheet so you know yeah all good with that but yeah we've still all got these buried mindset issues or concerns or worries or things that don't work quite right or the parts of it that we're scared of or definitely know, that we haven't done before so it's all good yeah. to explore and unpack well and the world that we live on the world that we live in points towards never feeling like you have enough or you are enough especially if you're socialized as a woman and that just gets mixed in with financial stuff this feeling of like needing more 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 or feeling like you lack capacity or it's just too much of a mess you're never going to be good about and good enough and if someone sees your mess then they're going to hate you or judge you whatever there's yeah there's just a lot of around it a previous podcast guest of mine um kj nasrol she said that money is charged and tender and i take that with me i think she summarized it so well mm. So much judgment on ourselves and probably on on everyone else. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, and we tend to judge others in equal proportion to how much we judge ourselves. So, yeah. Mm. 
So before we wrap up, do you want to just tell us something more about you personally or, you know, what, what things that you enjoy doing apart from obviously going out to theatre and art and music yeah. and all the rest of it? Where, <laughs> where, where's your uh, hobbies and pastimes heading? Yeah, so my dear loves at the moment, I will say that I am someone with a lot of interests and a lot of kind of simmering kind of areas that I might tend to in a given year and others not, but persistent loves gardening. I have a 10 foot by 12 foot garden bed in a state park that's a few blocks from me. And so I'm carefully growing some flowers for the second year in a row. And that gives me a lot of joy and sort of nurtures that long-term dream of living and working on land. And I'm also a slow runner and really love moving my body. And um, there's actually, for anyone else who's like in middle age and living in a fat body and wants to be a runner, there are so many cool resources out there. Not least there's a Facebook group called Fat Girl Running and there is a podcast, Not Your Average Runner. And so there's all these amazing resources. So like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to run. So I love being a slow runner and yeah, spending time with friends people who I love and giving them hugs. <laughs> oh, one day, one day soon. I'm sure one we're all going to get to that point. Yeah. It's been such a fantastic conversation. I really, yeah, I really love what you're doing and it sounds like it's incredibly needed and we, our, our whole entire culture and society is so much poorer as a society, both financially and emotionally and everything else. If we don't have those artists and creatives and makers and doers in it. And no we doubt. just need to do everything we can to lift them up and get them thinking about these things and doing everything they can to not be struggling to make ends meet. Yeah. So do you want to just finish by telling us a bit more about where people can find you, your services? Yeah. Best place to find me is my website, plumtreemoney.com. I have a PDF download if people are interested. It's called Three Simple Steps to Improve Your Finances Even When Your Money is a Mess. And of course, the podcast, Creatives Do Money, if folks like listening to podcasts. I am on Instagram, although a little ambivalently so, but I'm there for all of the genuine, like genuine relationship building. I'm there for it. All of the distraction and the comparisonitis, not so much. So I'm there sometimes and other times I'm not there, I will say, but yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you ever so much for joining us, Eowyn. And so for everyone else, if you um, you can read the show notes from this episode, to do that, you go to angelrated.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, I'd love you to subscribe to the show and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to share this episode with your online business friends, especially all those creatives and artists and makers out there. <laughs>